Welcome, everybody, to this Tuesday edition of Sports Shorts Daily, presented by our good friends over at LaBear's Casino in Baton Rouge. Rooftop pool now open to 21 and over, and all the restaurants as well. 18 Steak, one of the finest places you'll eat in all of Louisiana. Go check out LaBear's Baton Rouge Casino and Hotel, open 24-7, 365. Joining me is Glenn Gilbo in this strange, bizarre year of football. The one thing we can all agree on and be happy about, or at least 80% of Americans, is that football's back and we've got something to watch, college, pro. It's been, it, it was, this was a fun weekend. It was. It was, it was a strange weekend, but it was great being back in the, uh, in the Superdome for, for the Saints game. Easy to get to the game. <laughs> yeah, very easy to get to the game. I, I drove all the way up to the Superdome exit. I've never done that on game day. You know, usually got to approach some kind of strategy from the back, you know. Drove right up, you know, no trouble. But uh, it was weird. I mean, you could hear the players yelling. You could hear the refs talking to the players. And I was way up there, you know, in the press box. So, it was fun. I, I want to I talk about your Saints game day experience and walk us through it and, and what, what you could hear on the TV versus what you could actually hear in the dome and the whole nine yards. But I first want to touch on uh, some, some LSU news. Um, you had an article, of course, uh, that came out on the Gannett Services and USA Today and everything about uh, about the fact that LSU is getting a much-needed player, Neil Farrell Jr., back on its roster. This is such a bizarre year. I've never seen a player like say, hey, I'm out, I'm not playing this year, and then a month later they welcome him back with open arms, like a signing day type thing. Prodigal son. But yeah. You know, he's not really a prodigal son. I mean, Neil Farrell Jr. left – because of family concerns and COVID-19, specifically his grandmother. Uh, and he fully planned to come back next year and play for LSU. So his opt-out had nothing to do with the NFL, uh, unlike Chase and Shelvin and uh, Todd Harris, right? The, uh, or yeah, the other uh, safety. Um, but, or was that Kerry Vincent? That was Kerry Vincent. Kerry yeah. Vincent, I'm sorry. Todd Harris is the one coming back yeah. from uh, But no, Neil Farrell, uh, he, he decided really what the Pac-12 and Big Ten are doing. You know, he's like, wait a second, this isn't so right. bad. Maybe, maybe I can come back. So, so Neil came back to the facility over the weekend. His tweets late last week were like, uh, you know, I miss football. My grandmother's better. And then uh, officially uh, Coach O confirmed uh, yesterday and today that, that he is back on the team. Well, the good news is, is that, like you mentioned, and Coach O said this, they needed depth in the middle. He gives them depth. He played very well last year, um, coming off the bench in most games. And, you know, the reality is, is that I think everybody's getting a do-over. We, you know, we expect the Big Ten to kind of, you know, have some sort of vert reversion of the do-over. We know the Pac-12 might be a little bit further behind. But, um, you know, like I said, most years – you move on, you know, hey, player made his decision, you move on. But you mentioned also Farrell always intended to come back next year. This year doesn't count as a loss of, of season to anybody. The NCAA made that ruling that, hey, you can play this year and it doesn't count. It's basically an extra year. Uh, that's a big, big ruling. And it's, a, you know, it allows guys like, say, Neil Farrell, whether he truly has a pro shot or not, Hey, if he goes out and he plays well this year and puts up some good tape, he may not even be back next year. Or other players at least think that way. You know that they they have a chance now to it's a it's a mulligan year. Go out there, show off, make some plays, and 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 maybe uh, do like a Joe Burrow or Clyde edwards helaire jump so far up the up the charts you don't even come back uh, you, you, you next year. Right, and you know what though, if if this ends up being a pretty full season. Look for the NCAA to possibly change that rule, too. You think so? Back on that. I mean, I, I could see that possibly happening. But, uh, yeah, you know, it's uh, – the, the, the bottom line is you're giving kids more options, you know, and that's the right thing to do. And But I wouldn't it, – it's probably not good for all guys to just jump into the draft because there might be a lot of people doing that. So some guys who are borderline – you, you usually get better when you stay. You know, Tyler Shelvin made a mistake, you know, because he'd have definitely gotten better this season, regardless of how long or short it is, whereas Chase, you know, Chase is already there. A lot of people were kind of lumping Farrell and Shelvin together. We've seen reports over the last few days that both of them are considering returning and whatnot. Obviously, Coach O said uh, that hasn't happened yet when it comes to Shelvin. We know Farrell Jr. will be back uh, on an LSU uh, his practice this week. 
what is do you think going on with Tyler Shelvin? And is there really any credence to the fact that he may be coming, you know, returning? Well, I, I, I wrote that as a talk, you know, and Coach O did not confirm it. In fact, he said that that's not happening yet. And I, and I would guess that Tyler's probably had too much contact with, with agents because his decision was based on the NFL. Mm-hmm. Farrell's was based on COVID and his, and his family. So, you know, what usually happens is w- when a junior comes out early or they come out early, they, u- they usually get some money from their agent, some uh, maybe a car, uh, and, and they set, up, set them up at a workout facility. So I'm betting that, that Tyler may have had too much of that, that contact where he probably can't come back within the rules. So I doubt if we'll see Tyler back. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And, and we said it on this show. A lot of people have said it on their shows. You know, the Shelvin decision, not only from a football standpoint, you know, he, because they had so many people that have him anywhere ranked top 30 prospect to top 50 prospect. There's so much wiggle room on Shelvin's uh, projection in the draft that he's a guy that needed this year one to lock up a spot. He goes out there and dominates, you know, he might move into that first round or high second round and other, he's also the type of candidate we've heard throughout his career that, I mean, he's really going to be at home between now and next May and we don't expect him to balloon up and gain a bunch of weight. I know I would, I mean, well, hell everybody in the world did during COVID. So, I mean, well, uh, yeah, that would not be good, but maybe, you know, Maybe he would get his agent to set him up with a dietitian, you know. But but even if that happened, he would be much better off with Coach O keeping an eye on him. Because sure. Coach O's about gumbo and <laughs> Cal, and, and, and I, Coach O's already kind of taken Tyler under his wing. You know, Tyler was one of the first guys he recruited and signed as as head coach, and, and Coach O's a former D lineman, former D line coach. So I think Tyler would have really bettered himself by staying with Coach O. No, I 100% agree. What was your reaction to uh, seeing kind of the big boys in, in action for the first time? You know, the Notre Dames, the Clemsons of the world, you know, seeing, uh, I mean, boy, the Sun Belt really showed out. The Raging Cajuns uh, were one of uh, three teams in the Sun Belt that had major upsets against the Big 12. But what was your reaction to the first full weekend uh, uh, and, and seeing what else was out there? Well, it was great. You know, the the NFL, I've always said the NFL, it it's much better on – TV uh, sometimes, you know, so, so that, that Chiefs game, you didn't really notice to me that there weren't any fans there because, you know, they keep the cameras in. But that was a great game by Clyde Edwards-Solaire. That was, that was awesome. Uh, and then uh, Tulane comes back and beats South Alabama late in, in a brand-new stadium in South Alabama, which looked great on television. And then, then the big UL upset. I mean, Iowa State was only number 25, but still, that's the first road win of, against a ranked team they've ever had, the Cajuns. Mm-hmm. And they got into the top 25. So, uh, so that was awesome. And then, and then the, the, you know, the Saints won without really playing that well on offense, but their defense looked, looked really good. And, uh, you know, it, it, was, it was a strange Sunday in the Dome for sure. But the Saints look like they're as advertised to me. Um, I, you know, Clemson uh, dominated, but obviously with the expectation is Clemson to win 60 to nothing. And so when they don't, uh, you, you start to nitpick them a little bit. But I, I, I will say this. I was surprised, whether it was college or pro football, that the TV translates a lot better than we thought. Um, you know, I thought it would look cavernous. I thought it would look silly. Um, I thought it would sound silly uh, not having any fans in the stands. But they've done a nice job of kind of covering that up to as much as they can. You know, you really see it, of course, on field goals and extra points when you look up and there's nobody in the bleachers. But but I, I thought they've done a nice game. Yeah, <laughs> I thought they've done a nice job <laughs> of that. If you're the Big Twelve, you got to check yourself. You know, I mean, Kansas, oh. Kansas State, uh, you know, uh, uh, Iowa State, all go down. But that's where I think the and I, and, and I said this about golf. That this this is where with no fans the underdog has more of a chance because you don't have that pressure. You don't feel that pressure. You know, we've seen, uh, uh, you know, uh, if the Raging Cajuns run out of the tunnel and there's 50,000 fans in Iowa State and they're cheering against them and the band's going, one, Iowa State's more jacked up and fired up to play. You've got to deal with the noise when you're on offense. Now you don't have that. And I almost give the advantage to the Raging Cajuns for being more fired up to play. Iowa State runs out, empty stadium, no-name team, and all of a sudden they're like, eh, 
you know, go through the motions and the Raging Cajuns just whipped them. They were the better team on Saturday. Right. And, you know, that also might help a guy like Miles Brennan, you know, even at home, you know, Tiger Stadium, when it's full, it can make its own players nervous, sure. particularly quarterbacks playing for the first time, really, as a starter. And, uh, and also on the road, when, when Miles Brennan goes on the road, it's not going to be as intimidating as it, as it could have been. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it definitely, you know, even evens things out. And, you know, it, it could obviously hurt the Saints somewhat uh, at home uh, because, you know, they have one of the better home field advantages. But, um, you know, it, 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 it evens out. And, uh, you know, the Saints offense is, is based on a, on a lot of uh, very uh, organized technique, you know, so they might even be able to do that better in the quiet. Yeah, September 26th, the first game we'll see in Louisiana with fans for either Saints or LSU. And only about 25,000 plus will be there. That'll be basically like a large spring game crowd. Um, so right. very similar atmosphere to what you would get in a spring game. And the spring games don't usually make you throw up when you're a player to get nervous <laughs> ready for. But let's get, to, let's get to Sunday. I mean, the strangest Sunday you've ever had in your career covering the New Orleans Saints. You take us through the day and – how different was it from start to finish relative to you doing your job? Well, like I said, it was, it was a lot easier to get to the game. You sure. know, went right down I-10. Usually I take the, uh, the, um, that expressway uh, off of uh, Clearview, the Clearview expressway. Earhart, yeah, you go to Earhart. Earhart, I'm sorry, Earhart, and come in the, the back way, you know, from, from Loyola. This time I was able to drive right up to the dome, you know, and there was just nobody there, very little uh, security. Uh, and then the, the press box was, they did a great job of spreading out all the seats, you know, and, and. Uh, was that how they handled the press box? Was they just had like two, two or three empty seats in between you guys? Yeah. Yeah. It seemed like more than that, actually. Mm -hmm. might, might've been like three or four empty seats. Uh, and, and uh, it was spread out and my seat was, was, farther to the to the right of the of the dome but uh you know you could spread out I mean usually you're you're in there like sardines but the the funniest thing there was there was some kind of scout sitting near me and he, he was working a lot of details of the game and like me you know you're not really watching the game you're working and you kind of look up if you hear the noise okay right no noise so this guy was missing plays left and right I, I was making sure I was watching he missed like the the 40 yard pass to Cook. <laughs> quarter he missed the uh, pick six you know what happened what happened so I was telling him because you know you, you're everything's based on the crowd you know it happens all the time guys are writing they hear a big crowd noise they look up you know so mm -hmm. you be more alert but you know after a while it, it it was just another game the only thing was you know you could hear breeze you, you could hear the players talking amongst themselves right before the snap especially on defense you know, let's get them let's get them you know and and they were fights that that you could hear too you know like some cussing and stuff right know? it was kind of like being real close what about uh fake crowd noise you know on the broadcast uh you know they pipe in kind of that fake crowd noise cheers for the home team and whatnot did they have any of that in the dome yeah they did you know it's funny I, I was hearing from friends of mine watching the game at home like can you hear that fake crowd noise? And, and yeah, you could hear that. It, they would, it was funny. They didn't really start it, or I didn't notice it until about late in the first quarter. Maybe they had some technical difficulties. But, yeah, they, they piped in the crowd noise, and you could definitely hear it in the dome. That wasn't a TV effect. That, that was a, a dome effect. But was it, you know, you've been to the Dome probably at some time in your life during high school football state championships, you know, and, right. you know, when the 1A team plays, it's a much smaller crowd than when the 5A team plays. With the, with, with the way it was set up and with the, with the piped in crowd noise, was, was it substantial? Like, uh, could the crowd noise be a factor? Was it equivalent to, say, uh, you covering a 1A state championship uh, with, with no real big fans and a little bit of crowd noise? It was like covering you at Menard, Ron. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Nobody was there. No, we I'm never sure. made the dome. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it, it was the piped in fan noise sounded like when you go out to LSU practice and they and they're playing the speakers. Gotcha. But it that, that loud. It, it sounded fake. You know, they, they should have just not even done it. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't 
effective enough. It, it, it fooled no one. It, it, it brought no atmosphere. Maybe if they'd have turned it up louder, it, it could have worked better. But, um, you know, Jared Cook and some of the other players thought it was, it was too quiet. But, uh, you know, with, with that artificial, uh, you know. Did, so they that, play, did they play like wow. stand, did they play like get crunk in, after touchdowns? You know, the normal songs that you hear when you go to the game after the scores and things, did they play those? They played good before the game, but they didn't do anything special after touchdowns. Wow. You know, it was kind of, it was just kind of quiet. It was, it was really strange. Uh, and, uh, you know, people were out of sorts. I mean, uh, Sean Payton said he had an awful game. And I don't know if it was because of, of the, the strange uh, scene, but, you know, he, he criticized his own uh, play calling quite a bit. Uh, and, you know, and Brady and Breeze looked a little out of sorts, but also you right. got to, they didn't have preseason games too, you know, so all of that equal and into one made it, made it kind of a funny game. Finally, did, did, I know they had like the pregame where they run out with the fire and all those sorts of things. And did, did, did you sense that the players were played any different or the energy was different or the level of play was different because they didn't have fans? I think that uh, the the players were were engaged as much because you know the the players block out the noise. You know that's what Coach O always says. So to me, from just just looking at the players walking around, and they seemed the same to me because they were jumping up and down on the on the sidelines. You know, as as usual. Uh, it was funny though that they, they put the inactives in the stands. You know, like they had some players sprinkled around the stands. Those were the inactives, and they were trying to make all kind of noise, you know. So that rem that reminded me of playing eighth grade flag football. <laughs> There's just nobody out there, and you could hear people yelling. But um, So the inactives looked like the inactives looked like the Texas A&M yell squad with the towels and exactly. everything. <laughs> yeah, the, the 12th man. That's right. But, uh, it, was, it was weird, man. You know, hopefully the fans will be back before too long. Glenn, uh, interesting day, and, and, and at this point, the mayor has come out and said game two is going to be the same, right? I mean, I know there's hopes that maybe there'll be some retraction of that, but at this point, at least one more game of, of the exact same thing. going to be weird going from LSU where you, and, 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 you know, where you have fans and you cover LSU, but then you go to the Saints and you don't. After the game, obviously very different. You don't go into a big media room and locker room access and all that. How did you all do after the game? That was the best part. Uh, after the game at Saints games, they play the music real loud, win or lose, and you can't hear Peyton talking on the TV screen when you stay in the in the press box. Well, this time they had no music, and you zoomed in to Peyton. So I did it on my phone, had the speaker on, so I could hear him talking while I was writing. Uh -huh. So that happened to be easier. But it was it was kind of a funny press conference, uh, you know. Some of, the, some of the guys were asking the same questions that other people asked. You know, it wasn't, it wasn't the same kind of thing. And that got Sean kind of mad because he, he doesn't like the same question twice. But, but um, Sean was very good as, as usual and, and, you know, criticized himself, as I said. And what about access to the players? How did they handle that for the media? Well, it was the same thing. You know, they, they jumped on the same Zoom conference after Sean left and mm -hmm. who got up there, Cook, uh, Kamara couple other players that that was pretty much that was pretty much the same. and you know that's what we're going to do at, at LSU we're going to stay in the press box and they're going to uh have the interviews via via zoom or or a tv camera mm -hmm. any any talk uh do you expect that this is going to be the norm for the entire year for the media uh or do you think there's some point things could change no i, I think I, how it is for the rest of the year and you know that's that's one good thing that came out of all of this is that these zoom teleconferences are really good you know I, I, coach has said this and other people have said it they're probably going to continue to use those after covid goes away and you know in in addition to in-person interviews he's glenn gilbo glenn tell the folks uh how they can follow you on social media and read your stuff uh lsu beat me on, on twitter and on, on facebook uh TheAdvertiser.com put a story up this morning about Terrace Marshall Jr., LSU's last amigo after That's having right. three amigos last season. And, and uh, you know, in the beginning, Terrace was the highest rated receiver of those three coming mm -hmm. in. 
Uh, and if he has an injury-free year, he could really be good. And then I have the story of Neil Farrell up as well. Yeah, losing Jefferson and Chase over 190 catches combined between those two guys a year ago. That's a big, big loss. So a lot, of, a lot on Terrace Marshall's shoulders uh, this year. He's Glenn Gilbo. Check him out on TigerBeatTweet.com. Also, special thanks to LaBear's Casino, sponsor of Sports Short Daily, and uh, ESPN 104.5 in Baton Rouge. I'm Ronnie Rance. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Go to YouTube and subscribe to Sports Shorts, hosted by Ronnie Rance. Thank you. Thank you.